the exarabate. I would be on the watch a little bit more for them than, say, for Quakers um, and Mormons. I just would, and I don't expect anyone, if anyone wants to make an innuendo about this, they can see me afterwards, where I will be standing. Okay? ID cards? Um, I, yes, I suspect it's possible. Um, I, I certainly don't think there's any good reason to put, uh, to put someone's religion on their ID card. I think, in fact, there's every reason not to. But no, on the other know. hand, of course, it is um, um, obvious that if your name is Singh and someone can see that your name is Singh because they ask for your ID card, then they will assume you are Sikh. If your name is Cohen or Finkelstein, they'll assume quite wrongly very often that you're Jewish because it only means your father was, and that won't necessarily give you the full, the full hog, as, uh, as the whole hog is... Um, <laughs> Yes, Jonathan Miller's line, not mine. Yes. But, um, yes, but, but it, it's, um, you do it better. Oh, well, thank you. Uh, so, no, it seems to me, uh, uh, I don't know what our government's latest plans are on ID cards, but I don't think they involve giving people's uh, religions. But certainly, yes, their names, uh, of course, it will get release, increase religious awareness. Um, there's no question. But the name thing is interesting. I mean, uh, Forster, to return to our hero, who wrote a very good book, uh, a very good essay on, on Jew consciousness, I think, in Two Cheers for Democracy, wasn't it, where he makes the point that um, we, know, we don't know if we're Jewish or not. I mean, the, I think he says the Prince of Wales, he's writing in the 30s, the early 30s, the Prince of Wales, he says, who probably comes from the most well-known and well-documented family on earth, probably can't name his eighth great-grandparents. Um, and if he come, what chance have we got? Uh, and, and you, also, you know, the family that's been most prayed for. Yes, in the most prayed with the least for. least success. <laughs> <laughs> right, that's a good... I mean, prayers for the royal family are compulsory by millions of people every Sunday. Yes, the efficacy is for not... For years. And, yeah. Yeah, it doesn't seem to have caught on. <laughs> <laughs> One last question, then. Somewhere here. Thanks. Um, Siri, just on the subject of uh, saving E.M. Forster, although not in the religious sense... Um, <laughs> Forster wrote in How It's End that truth being alive was not halfway between anything. It was only to be found by continual excursions into either realm. And though moderation is the ultimate goal, to begin with it is to ensure sterility. And it strikes me that one of the problems that secular society, and in particular militantly secular society, has had is with a failure of imagination, a failure with its own imagination when it threw out the, the beautiful liturgy, the poetry of the King James Bible, it didn't replace it with anything else. And we're now left with almost this Dawkin-esque, atomistic, reductivist society. And if we are intent, as, as Christopher is, in, in being anti-theistic, in, in creating a society whereby we don't bow to the theism of the external God and we care about you know, the internal uh, humanity, how can we infuse secular society with the poetry and the liturgy to make people care about each other in, in, a, in, in an almost religious notion? Thank you. Secular, yes. are, a failure of the imagination. I think, I think it's fair to say almost every failure of humanity is a failure of imagination to some extent, a failure to penetrate the minds of others. I, there's a, what you were saying reminded me a little of a line of G.K. Chesterton said uh, the trouble, he was of course a religious man as we know, and um, not an entirely nice one, but he did say some very good things. And one of the things he said was the trouble with uh, atheism, as far as he was concerned, is when you stop believing in God, you don't believe in anything, you don't believe in nothing, you believe in, in anything. And, and perhaps we do live in a culture where uh, reason and so on are, are, are not, you know, not glorified, uh, uh, and uh, if, <laughs> at the risk of saying it, deified, as, as perhaps they should be. However, I don't think we should ever allow religion the trick of maintaining the, the spiritual and the beautiful and the noble and the altruistic and the morally strong and the virtuous are in any way uh, inventions of religion or particular or peculiar to religion. It's certainly true that you could say the Christ who said, um, let him who is without sin cast the first stone, that's a wonderful thing to have said. Anybody who said that one would earn a great deal of respect and interest you say well that's a, that's a, one of the most beautiful <laughs> phrases ever ever uttered um but there is no absolutely no monopoly on on beauty and truth in in religion and i suppose one of the reasons that i'm so fond of the greeks and one of the reasons that the great radical and poet shelley wrote his prometheus unbound is because he understood that if you were to compare the genesis myth which is which had bedeviled our culture, the Western European culture, for a very long time indeed, for 2,000 years. It was essentially a myth in which 
uh, in which we should be ashamed of ourselves. God says, who told you you were naked? What possible reason have we to believe that we are naked or that if we are naked, there is something to be ashamed of? That what we are and what we do is something for which we should ever apologize. We should apologize for our dreams, our impulses, our appetites, our drives, our desires, and not things to apologize for. Our actions sometimes we do apologize for, and we excoriate ourselves for them rightly. But that's the Genesis myth. The Greek myth of Prometheus, who stole fire from heaven and gave it to his favorite, immor his favorite uh, mortal, man. In other words, the Greeks were saying, we have divine fire. Whatever is divine is in us. As humans, we are as good as the gods. The gods are capricious and mean and foolish and stupid and jealous and rapine and all the things that Greek mythology shows that they are. And that's a much better explanation, it seems to me. And for that, the gods punished Prometheus and chained him to the Caucasus and vultures chewed away his liver every day as it regrew because he was immortal, of course. And, and, and Shelley quite rightly understood, and interestingly his wife, of course, wrote Frankenstein as the modern Prometheus, understood that that mythological idea, the champion of a real humanity and a real humanism, as we've come to call it, is that we are captains of our soul and masters of our destiny, and that we contain any divine fire that there is, divine fire that is fine and great. And it's perfectly obvious that if there were ever a god, he has lost all possible taste. And you've only got to look, forget the... <laughs> forget the aggression and the unpleasantness of the radical right or the Islamic uh, hordes to the east, um, the sheer lack of intelligence and insight and uh, ability to express themselves and to enthuse others of the priesthood, the clerisy here in this country um, and indeed in Europe. God once had Bach and Michelangelo on his side. He had Mozart. And now, who does he have? People with ginger whiskers and tinted spectacles who, who reduce the glories of theology to a kind of sharing. You know? That's, that's what religion has become, a feeble and anemic uh, nonsense. Because we understood that the fire was within us. It was not in some idol on an altar, whether it was a gold cross or whether it was a Buddha or anything else, that we have it. The fault is in our stars, but also the glory is, is in us, not in our stars. The glory, anything... We take credit for what is great about man and we take blame for what is dreadful about man. We neither grovel or apologize at the feet of a god or are so infantile as to project the idea that we once had a father as human beings and we therefore should have a divine one too. We have to grow up, which is partly what Christy was saying. Shalom. That is the most wonderful tribute to the human spirit. I use the word spirit. Do you want to? Mr. Nala?